Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to this series trying to explain what epilepsy is. In this episode, I'll be talking about the ongoing debate that exists with regards to the current definition. If you had a look at my first video, you can click to it by utilizing the iCard above. I provided a conceptual definition of epilepsy as a susceptibility to recurrent epileptic seizures. And I explained that a susceptibility meant that there is a imbalance between either the excitation that's going on inside the brain or a lack of the checks and balances of inhibition working effectively and this predisposing people to having seizures. The ILAE report of uh, 2014, which provided a practical clinical definition of epilepsy, has provided further information as to exactly what we mean by a recurrence risk. And you can see more information in that original video. However, if we go back to the initial conceptual definition that they provided in 2005, they said the following. An epileptic seizure is a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And that simply put is a way of describing a epileptic seizure as being a event. Epilepsy, however, is a disorder of the brain characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate epileptic seizures and by the neurobiological, cognitive, psychological and social consequences of this condition. And it carries on the definition of epilepsy requires the occurrence of at least one epileptic seizure. That's quite a wordy conceptual definition and was not easy to use in clinical practice. And that prompted a practical definition to be designed in 2014 and in my original video you'll see that I've used their definitions of recurrence risks but I missed out the top line of their definition now which is epilepsy is a disease of the brain defined by any of the following conditions and so clearly that's quite a shift from having previously described that as being a disorder of the brain characterized by an enduring predisposition, etc. And so the first point of real debate is whether we should be seeing epilepsy as a disease or as a disorder. This has caused a tremendous amount of upset amongst people who have epilepsy and uh, various epilepsy support groups. With regard to this new definition, the ILAE promotes the concept of talking about this as a disease with the following advantages. First of all, it conveys that this is a serious condition and needs to be uh, treated and people need to be aware about it and it will assist them in funding applications for research grants, etc. They also say that by calling it a disease, it highlights the persistence of the dysfunction. Of course, there are a number of disadvantages with this too. Um, of course, those highlighted by people with epilepsy will, of course, say that it is stigmatizing. It sounds like it can be caught or it's something that's catchy, can spread to other people, calling it a disease. When we think about the variety of causes of epilepsy, we immediately can appreciate that it is not a single entity. It is not a disease. Um, there are numerous different causes that can underlie epilepsy, whether it's a structural brain problem or whether it's to do with an iron channel dysfunction. So it's very difficult to say that it is a disease and imply that it is a singular um, problem. It's also debatable, perhaps, uh, whether the situation with epilepsy is perhaps more akin to an arrhythmia than to uh, the comparisons that the ILAE drew to ischemic heart disease or to cancer. There, the um, reality is, is that there are very clear um, changes to the actual structure of cells or to the, uh, in, in the case of cancer or in the case of ischemic heart disease with atherosclerotic plaques, that's the sort of buildup of uh, fatty layers within the arteries to the heart. And those are very clear structural changes. A disease implies a structural problem and that's certainly not the case with epilepsy. There are plenty of people with epilepsy who have got clean MRI scans and you know, even if you do more detailed uh, MRI scans, uh, 7T, you, know, you can really get down to a very microscopic level in looking at the brain. And yes, it will be able to pick up some more people 
who have very subtle underlying structural anomalies. However, there are certainly people who do not have any structural issues that we can easily identify. Um, of course, you know, technology evolves constantly. We now have some very advanced PET scanners and, and so forth, which can look at um, networks even of, and how they are structured across the brain. But in terms of trying to like, pinpoint, you know, this is a abnormal point, an abnormal focus, um, which we can actually uh, directly treat or remove can sometimes be very difficult. So it's not a universal um, scenario where we can actually pinpoint exactly where the problem is coming from and therefore to say that there is a structural issue in this one point. And so I think that on a technicality, even the word disease, uh, which implies a structural problem, is not a catch-all type of term which we could use and perhaps disorder or persistent disorder would be a better um, way of describing the situation with epilepsy if it needs to have those words in at all. I'm not sure that that first line was actually necessary. One could simply have said and this is purely my own view that epilepsy is defined by any of the following conditions. You know, either at least two unprovoked seizures or one unprovoked seizure plus a high risk or uh, an epilepsy syndrome being diagnosed. So those are the immediate points of debate just on reclassifying epilepsy from being a disorder of the brain to a disease of the brain. I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts, your views as to how you think epilepsy should be defined. Should this be considered a disease? Should it be considered a disorder, a dysfunction, something else or none of the above? Please do feel free to write something in the comment section below. The other major group of points of debate focus around the group of people who have a single seizure but have increase factors for having further seizures in the future. There are a number of advantages to being able to do this. Of course, one is able to commence treatment sooner. This, of course, can reduce the risk of further harm. Clearly, it allows integration of biomarkers. So if we have an imaging result which shows, for example, a tumor or something like that, uh, which will have a high risk of generating further seizures, then that's really useful information to be able to put into our model and to say a person who has had a single seizure in the context of this particular brain tumor, for example, um, will be at risk of further seizures and therefore would benefit from being on treatment sooner. Or alternatively, one might be able to integrate information from the EEG as well. Of course, all of this allows for person-specific care, which is really what medicine is all about. We can try and make an assessment of what the risks are and give people who come to us with the symptoms of having had a seizure and with whatever test results, a very specific tailor-made informative package as to what the risks are going forward of further seizures occurring and what the benefits or otherwise of treatment would be. And of course, ultimately, it reflects clinical reality and decision making. These are the advantages of having earlier identification of people with epilepsy. There are, of course, some disadvantages to this as well. Of course, it's very difficult to ascribe precise probabilities to any individual person that their risk of epilepsy after having a first unprovoked seizure is going to be 60%, it's going to be 80%, it's going to be 90%, it might only be 10%. It's very, very difficult to know. Fundamentally as well, in terms of the way it's been constructed, it's based on research. And of course, data extrapolation from five-year observational studies to calculate 10-year risks, which have not really been published about, uh, may overestimate the recurrence. About we, we may be labeling people with epilepsy too early on. There are, of course, social, psychological and economic consequences uh, to having this label. And of course, if we start treating people earlier, well, there are medication side effects. Although it's important to recognize that these are usually mild and reversible, these really can affect certain people and quite significantly difficult to predict, of course. And so there are some disadvantages to doing this. 
In my personal opinion, I think that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. We, in a medical career, try and give people the best information that we can do using the best available evidence. If we're able to give people a personal choice based on pertinent information as best as we can we can have it, then that is a good thing. And if we can reduce harm by commencing treatment sooner, then that is beneficial. Clearly, this will have an impact on some people who would not have previously been labelled as having epilepsy. However, it is difficult to imagine that there would have been a substantive switch in numbers uh, in terms of people affected by this. The American Association of Neurologists and the American Epilepsy Society, subsequent to the ILAE guidelines, investigated a very important series of questions as to what should be done following a first unprovoked seizure. They looked through the literature and they asked the following questions. What would be the benefit of commencing anti-epileptic therapy straight away? Would it reduce the risk of seizure recurrence and would that affect quality of life? In addition to which, would that affect the prognosis? In other words, if you start treatment earlier, is there any benefit in terms of the epilepsy potentially resolving earlier? And what are the risks of side effects um, from taking anti-epileptic medications? Are they significant or are they something which generally tend to be mild? They came up with the following findings. First of all, commencing anti-epileptic therapy actually reduces the risk of a second seizure by 35% or so in the two years subsequent to the first one. However, it may not improve quality of life and that finding in of itself is not a great surprise. With regard to the question of prognosis, in other words, does starting treatment earlier shorten the overall duration of the epilepsy? They found that it would not make any improvement of the prognosis for seizure remission. So, if you start it earlier, it doesn't reduce the length of time that a person has the diagnosis of epilepsy and seizure remission. With regard to the question of what are the side effects of anti-epileptic medications, they found that a minority of patients had side effects from the medication, somewhere between 7 and 30 percent, and that on the whole these adverse effects were predominantly mild and reversible. Thanks for watching. Please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Follow the conversation on Twitter, hashtag TalkEpilepsy. I look forward to hearing your comments below. Many thanks.